So welcome back to Astronomy 101. Today, hey domestic, we are going to be doing uh, Kepler's laws and Galileo today. Um, I'm still working out the, the webcam situation, so I know it will flicker. I know it's dropping some frames here, um, but hey, GTG. And that's just still a work in progress. If it dies, I have a backup ready to go. So <laughs> don't stress about that, but I appreciate all of you being vigilant with that. We will get it working and I promise it will be super worth it. So on that note, we are going to just dive right in. So last week, what we did is we kind of took a step aside from the astronomy thing and started looking more at the history of it. We talked about parallax. Now, this is something I definitely want to talk a little bit about because I didn't really give one of my favorite examples for how parallax works. But remember, we were talking about parallax in the context of the ancient cultures dismissing the heliocentric sun-centered model because they felt that if the earth was going around the sun, when it was on one side, the stars would look like they were in a different position than if they were on the other side because we would be closer to that celestial sphere. Oh, I hate Joel. Um, one of the things with parallax that I, yes, we are <laughs> for sure. Um, but one of the things that I didn't talk about was just this idea that you can see a parallax effect yourself. If you stick your thumb out in front of you and just look at where your thumb is blocking and close one eye, and then if you switch eyes, if you can, and close the other eye, your thumb appears to be in a different position relative to the background. And that's parallax. Imagine like, the earth is on one side of the sun here and the other side of the sun here and you're staring at a star here compared to the background stars, that is parallax. So you can play with that yourself, um, but that's sort of a great example of parallax. We talked about these ancient roots of astronomy, the fact that these ancient cultures are, um, you know, have been, have used astronomy for ages for measuring the seasons, measuring days, measuring, you know, even rainy seasons, looking at how the phases of the moons change from month to month and how ancient cultures measured sort of solstice and equinox to be able to mark points that were relevant, particularly for crops, knowing how long days would be, knowing how seasons change and all of that. We talked about the, ge the Greek geocentric model, this, uh, the Ptolemy, the Ptolemaic model, where the earth was at the center and then we had this really complicated method <laughs> of uh, measuring how the earth would go around or how the sun would go around the earth and then all the planets are going around the earth as well. And that was the Ptolemaic mo model that lasted for hundreds of years. And then got slightly into the Copernican revolution where Nicholas Copernicus, the, everyone sort of knew the Ptolemaic model wasn't working, wasn't doing what we needed it to do. It was always off by a little bit. And so he revisited, Nicholas Copernicus revisited the heliocentric model where we put the sun at the center. Um, but his tables still weren't great. There were still issues with it. And Tycho Brahe tried to take better and better data, not necessarily to refute or anything Copernicus's model. He just, he felt that the data that we had wasn't good enough. So it was like, I'm not gonna solve the problem. I'm just gonna take really good data so the rest of you can figure it out, which is exactly what Johannes Kepler did, which is what we're gonna get into today. But before we do that, as Freys mentioned, the parallax thing, we just saw an awesome actual example of parallax. So I'm going to show this example using Wolf 359, uh, which is an actual star, not just a plot point in Star Trek. <laughs> but there was a massive battle with the Borg at Wolf 359 <laughs> in the Star Trek realm. This is in uh, our pre-Cochrane era. Not real world, but it is real world. But it's the pre-Cochrane era. But remember, parallax. Okay, stick your, th stick your thumb out. Switch eyes. We're going to have one eye being Earth, the other eye being New Horizons. So in a slightly different position. Oh, thank you, Vinny. That's awesome. Um, in a slightly different position relative to the background stars. All right. So we have Earth is here. Um, the New Horizons telescope is here. And the thumb is Wolf 359. And then we have all the background stars. So you can see the position changing slightly depending on where we are viewing it from. So we have Earth and then New Horizons and Wolf 359 is appearing 
is appearing to change position uh, due to parallax. All that said, these guys in the Copernican Revolution did not have a telescope out of the outer regions of the um, solar system, but this is parallax. <laughs> Brad, <laughs> that's awesome. Fabulous. I love it. All right. So cool. Awesome. This was like this week they released it. This is parallax from two different positions in our solar system, trying to image the same star. Um, again, Earth, New Horizons, Thumb is Wolf 359, and you have all the background stars there. So this is actual parallax that we are observing. Awesome. And that being said, this isn't like the first time we've observed parallax. This is just um, where it's super easy to see. <laughs> because we have better telescopes, modern telescopes, we have observed parallax with the Earth on different sides of the sun. This is just a very clear, awesome example that also ties to Star Trek. So we talked about why they still struggled with the Copernican revolution. Oh, we're not going to get into what parsecs are right now because that's, that's a whole other thing. And we've got to talk about Kepler's laws today, but we will get to parsecs later that has to do with parallax. We'll just keep giving examples as we go. <laughs> um, but remember, Copernicus was using this heliocentric model, but it still sucked. It still wasn't good. And it was not being adopted mostly for the reason they assumed orbits were perfect circles. Johannes Kepler, remember, was Tycho Brahe's student. He made the breakthrough just by saying, what if they're not perfect circles? What if we let go of that concept that the heavens aren't perfect and we assume that these orbits are not circular? Then what? And that fixed it. That, that started to fix everything. So this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, Basically saying, okay, let's not imagine that planetary orbits are circular, but instead they are an ellipse. This is going to be important to talk about. So we're going to talk a little bit about the geometry of an ellipse. I said that, you know, this one, there's some math and there are some equations, but I'm not going to make you do it. But if you don't remember geometry or you didn't have a chance to learn this stuff, here's a perfect circle. The only thing you need to know about a circle is its radius. That will tell you everything you need to know. You can draw a circle by putting a pencil or sticking something, you know, onto your table in one spot attached with a string and draw out a perfect circle. You just need that radius. If you want an ellipse, you have to have two points that are stuck into the table. Take a loop of string, take your pencil, and you can draw an ellipse with these uh, as your limiting factors here. Now, the big components of an ellipse that you need to understand uh, is the major axis. Major axis is the long part. The minor axis is the short part. We talk about these two points here as the focus. Again, imagining that you had a, a pencil attached to this. This is how you would draw out. You need these two foci. Foci? Foci? I've never really understood how to say that. Uh, but you need these two focus points. Um, to draw it on an ellipse. And then the semi-major axis is the part that ties to astronomy the most. That's basically just saying, you know, the half, the half of the major axis. It's the semi-major axis. Uh, this is what we're going to be using in astronomy the most. And um, so these are the geometry <laughs> foci, foci. Um, <laughs> these are the major components of an ellipse. So when Kepler said, all right, let's throw out the idea that these orbits are perfect circles. We're going to look at them being an ellipse. You now need to calculate these different parts. And this is the direction that he went in that results in our um, uh, laws of motion for planets that we're going to talk about. Now, when we talk about an ellipse, one of the things we also talk about is, is it, it's eccentricity. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Becca, sci-fi foci. That works. <laughs> I love it. We got it. Um, if we say that the eccentricity of an ellipse is zero, equal to zero, that's a perfect circle. So you can make a perfect circle with an ellipse by just saying that eccentricity is zero. As it increases, it starts to get more highly eccentric. It just becomes more of a flattened oval. Again, 
when it comes to orbits. We're not going to be worrying about the geometry. We're not going to be worrying about that. We're just talking about planetary orbits. We can use the eccentricity as part of that as well. So if we say a planet or a comet, most commonly, has a highly eccentric orbit, that means that its orbit is a flattened out ellipse. I hope that makes sense. All right. So going from that, Kepler had all this data that Tycho Brahe had taken. He was now playing with the idea that these orbits were ellipses. And from that, he developed the three laws of planetary motion. It's really important to remember here that this is about half a century, I think, before Newton's laws of gravity. So this is just observing geometries. This is not looking at the forces involved. This is not looking at physics. This is just geometry to observations in space, which is pretty phenomenal. It's pretty awesome. Um, the first law of planetary motion that he discovered through this was that the orbit of each planet around the sun is an ellipse where the sun is one of the focus points and there's nothing at the other focus point. Um, again, don't worry about gravity, don't worry about Newton, don't worry about any physics laws, this is just the geometry. So the orbit of each planet as it goes around the sun is an ellipse where the sun is at one focus point. Now the example I showed you is highly elliptical. It's not that elliptical, um, but it still works. So you're going to have like this, the two focus points of the orbits are going to be pretty close together. But the point is, is that the sun is at one of those focus points. The second one is, uh, and I'm going to break down all of these and show visuals for them as well. But the second law of planetary motion is that as a planet moves around its orbit, it sweeps out equal areas in equal time. I will show a graphic for this that will help you understand it a little bit better. It's basically saying that measure a planet as it's moving around over like a few days. And if you map that onto its, you know, ellipse that it's building out, calculate the area that it just swept and then measure it at a different point in its orbit for the same number of days, draw that on the ellipse, it's going to be the same area. You'll see what that means in a second. The third law of planetary motion is that Distant planets, ones that are further away, orbit the sun at slower average speeds that obeys a very precise mathematical relationship. This is going to be much easier to show with a graph, believe it or not. <laughs> I know people start to panic with that, but it is going to make a lot more sense when you see this graphically. Uh, when we talk about sort of orbits and averages and all of that, um, we're just saying, look at the average speed of a planet as it's going around the sun. If it's further away, it's going to be taking a longer time to go than the ones that are closer. Again, we kind of know that intuitively. If you have remembered any astronomy you may have learned in the past, Mercury orbits the sun a lot faster than Saturn. And then, you know, Neptune takes a long time to orbit the sun. Those are the ones that are further away. As you get closer, they orbit faster. That's all this is saying. The detail is that it's a very precise relationship. So let's break each of these down. The first law is that um, the orbit of each planet is an ellipse with the sun at one focus point. That's all it is. All it is is saying that the planet's orbits are an ellipse and the sun is one of the focus points. Again, this is a very extreme example. These are much closer to being circular. Again, it this was why it was hard for them to let go of this idea. But, um, but thinking about it this way, here's the sun at one of the focus points. The other focus point is empty. Um, the planet, as it's going around, when it's the these are just kind of words that I'm gonna use that I'm gonna define right now. Don't stress too much about them, but we will be mentioning them later and they are some of my favorite words in astronomy. <laughs> but when a planet is at its closest point to the sun, we call it the perihelion. When it's at its furthest point away from the sun, we call it the aphelion of the orbit. Basically, peri is the close point. Helion, helios, means sun. And then aphelion, uh, furthest point, helion. My favorite word ever is paragalacticon. That means when you're the closest to the center of the galaxy versus the furthest way. But paragalacticon is my favorite um, word <laughs> ever. So 
Uh, if you take the average of these two points, that's how you end up with sort of the average distance from the sun. Um, that's where we say, you know, the earth is X, uh, away from the sun. We say it's one astronomical unit. We define that measure tape. One astronomical unit is the average distance between the sun and the earth. Because it's elliptical, there's going to be a point where it's slightly closer, a point where it's slightly further away. But if you take the average, that's the distance that we use, and that's that semi-major axis. Again, they're not this extreme. It's just to drive home the geometries that are going on here. So if we got that down. All right. The orbit of each planet around the sun is an ellipse, and the sun is at one focus point. <laughs> it's true. Paragalacticon. I do have a production company. <laughs> I needed a company, and I called it Paragalacticon Productions because I got to use that word. <laughs> But anyway, um, so uh, that's, that's our first law of motion. Kepler's second law, this is the one that gets a little bit hard to wrap our brains around. As a planet moves through its orbit, it sweeps out, <laughs> right? Perihelion, I love that name, Peri for short. Um, as a planet moves around its orbit, it sweeps out equal areas in equal times. Again, here's the visual of it. I'll show sort of an animated one second. But if you measure A to B, this is, let's imagine that you are measuring where a planet is here at A, and then 10 days later, it's at B. Again, you map out the geometries of that. You calculate the areas. This is just elliptical geometry. We don't have to actually do it. But if you remember, um, you know, if you remember geometry, knowing all of those things about the ellipse, like the foci, the you know the eccentricity, uh, the semi-minor, semi-major axis, all of those things, you can calculate areas throughout that. So from A to B, 10 days, let's say. Then you, at some point later, C, C to D is 10 days. This area is going to be equal to this area. It might not look like it, but remember, it's closer, so this distance is shorter. And then this is further away, so you have this long distance here, but these are going to add up to be equal. And that's the second law of motion. I'm glad that makes sense. Um, some of these work for some people, some it's harder to understand. But here's sort of a visual of it, mapping it out, um, that you can see these uh, areas are equal. So A is equal to B here. And then um, a lot of that has to do, again, it really is the fact that these laws were established before Newton's laws of gravity. Newton's laws of gravity is applied to these relationships, trying to figure out what force was causing this to happen. But really what's at the core of this law, this, ideal, this idea that it sweeps out, is exactly the phenomenon you're seeing here. That when it's at its perihelion, when it's closer, it moves faster, sweeps out a, uh, an area, when it's further away, it's moving slower. When it's at its aphelion, it's moving slowly. But because it's far away, it sweeps out that same amount of area, which is that phenomenon you're seeing here. So Kepler's second law. Planet moves through its orbit, sweeps out equal areas over an equal period of time. First law, it's an ellipse. Sun is at the focus point. Second law, sweeps out equal areas over an equal period of time. Now, the third law, this is where the equation comes in. <laughs> um, but it's a good relationship here that, like I said, it helps just seeing it on a graph. And again, this is something we kind of just know intuitively. But all it is saying is the more distant planets, the ones further away from the sun, orbit slower than the ones that are closer to the sun. And there is a precise mathematical relationship here where you're seeing P is the period. A is the distance away. So this is how long it takes to go around. This is how far away it is from the sun. Um, here it is mapped out. So here we have the period. Uh, this is squared. This is cubed. So again, here, semi-major axis. Remember, that's that average distance between the sun and the planet. Um, so the cube of the semi-major axis compared to the square of how long it takes to go around in years. If you map out the planets on it, that's a perfect line. Now, again, we've kind of squared it and cubed it here. So you see that it's a proportional relationship. That's a level of math details. If it's hurting your head, don't stress about. The main thing to point out is that they all fall on a straight line when you calculate them this way. 
Here's another way to visualize it that doesn't have those like square and cube things in it. This is just saying how far away it is from the sun in astronomical units. Remember, one astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the sun. Um, and then how fast it's moving. So Mercury's going fast. As you get further away, your speed starts to slow down. Hope that helps. Again, Kepler's third law of planetary motion. Planets that are further away orbit slower. Planets that are closer go slowly. So, hope that helps. All right. Um, so, weirdly, um, no. And that we'll get into next week because that has to do with Newton's laws of physics. And that is weird. It's counterintuitive. I agree. It's a great question. It's a really, really great question, um, Ben, I, that... Uh, no, the mass does not have an effect on how fast it's moving because it's the combined mass of, um, of all of it together. We'll talk about Newton's laws next week, um, but that's where you'll see, we'll, we'll answer that question. And hopefully we'll see that uh, it doesn't make a difference. All that matters is the mass of the sun. So I hope that helps. But again, this is just, this is before Newton's laws. So they weren't even concerned about masses or gravity or anything. They were just trying to figure out um, any relationships here with the geometries. And so that's why this is a distinct law from the other ones, that this is not really related necessarily to the ellipse. This is just saying ones closer orbit fast, ones that are far away orbit slowly. All that matters. Yeah, pun intended. All right. Um, so those are the three laws of motion. It's an ellipse, sun at the center sweeps out equal areas over equal times, distant planets orbit slowly, ones closer orbit faster, and it's a precise mathematical relationship. Um, so, pretty cool. All it's saying is too, that uh, if you know how, what its period around the sun is, you know how far away it is, which is pretty cool. But I promised I wouldn't make you do math. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll leave those there. Now, they still had a problem with this. Now, remember the heliocentric, <laughs> the heliocentric model, that's basically saying the sun is at the center of the solar system. This is what Copernicus was working on, that he had dug up this ancient, you know, Grecian astronomer that had looked into this and had dismissed it. There were still objections to this, even though Kepler was establishing these laws. What was making it hard to drive home is that First, Aristotle, a lot of it was going back like 2,000 years to the ancient Greeks, which is why they couldn't let go of the heliocentric model. Aristotle said, <laughs> and this is interesting, Earth could not be moving. It could not be orbiting the sun because objects in the air would be left behind as the Earth moved. They still struggled with that. Even though Kepler had, you know, figured all this out, he had, you know, figured out the eccentricities, he'd figured out all of these relationships, and it all matched Tycho Brahe's data, we still couldn't let go of the fact that, like, well, if the Earth is moving, when I toss a ball up into the air, why doesn't it just disappear if the Earth is moving around? Weird. Second one is non-circular orbits contradicted, <laughs> right? It's a fun visual. Non-circular orbits contradicted the claim that the heavens are perfect. Remember, this was the big breakthrough that Kepler achieved. He said, they're not perfect circles, they're ellipses. And people still struggled with that. They said, they can't be. It has to be perfect. The heavens have to be perfect. Aristotle said it. This is a deep core philosophical belief that the heavens are perfect, that they behave in ways and have relationships that we view as perfect. In some way, this is what, you know, resulted in the understanding that the earth is round because the heavens are perfect. So this was hard to wrap their heads around. The other one is that no one had detected the stellar parallax. Remember, as earth is on one side versus on the other side, no one had seen the stars appear to be in different positions compared as you moved around. Um, or when you're on one side looking at a star in this direction versus this side, it's not changing positions against the back. Where's the stellar parallax? Um, so these are the three objections that people were still having a hard time getting over. Uh, even though now we have these models that are working, why aren't things 
if I throw a ball, why isn't it disappearing? If the earth is not is moving, um, they can't be an ellipse because the heavens are perfect and no one had detected stellar parallax. This was still the mental blocks to approving the heliocentric model. Um, so it got, along came Galileo. We love Galileo. He addressed each of these in short order um, that really drove these points home. So first he showed that objects in motion will stay in motion without an outside force. This is before Newton. This is one of Newton's laws. But a lot of Galileo's experiments involved rolling balls down inclined planes and seeing that if they roll, they continue to roll. And that sort of fundamentally was like, okay, well, if our, we're moving, even if I toss a ball in the air, if it's already moving as the earth is going around, it's going to keep moving in that direction. Um, same reason, you know, when you toss a coin on an airplane, it's just going to fall right back down. Those were the types of experiments that he was working on and realizing that, you know, if an object is in motion, it's going to stay in motion unless you have a force acting on it, which disputes the, it's a little bit of a round, it's a little bit of a, an around explanation, but, but this started to chip away at that idea that it had to be perfect. The next one was, um, remember that they couldn't be perfect. Uh, this idea that the orbits had to be perfectly circular, circular. Tycho Brahe had already seen things like uh, a comet. He'd observed a comet and thanks Josh and a nova, which we now know was a supernova. But remember in the early 1600s, he observed, a, or late 1500s, he observed a nova, a, a change to the skies. A star appeared um, that hadn't been there before. So there was already this idea that there were imperfections, but Galileo used a telescope. Remember, all of Tycho Brahe's data was taken without a telescope. He just had this incredibly precise naked eye observatory. Galileo did not invent the telescope. This had been invented earlier, but he was the first one to use it as for science. Previously, it was a toy. Galileo was the first one to use it for science. And through using a telescope and making observations of the heavens, he was able to, oh, thank you for the follow. He was able to observe imperfections, most particularly sunspots. That was kind of the first thing to see that there were spots on the sun as well as the moon. He observed these ridges, that it wasn't a perfectly flat surface. He was able to observe shadows on the moon using his telescope. So all of these little, you know, okay, we've seen a, so we've seen objects from Tycho Brahe. We've seen objects appear that weren't there previously. Galileo started to observe imperfections. The moon wasn't a perfectly flat surface. It had mountains and valleys and there were spots on the sun. That really chipped away at the idea that it had to be perfect. So once they accepted that the heavens weren't perfect, then they were, then society was able to accept this idea that it's not a perfect circle, that it's okay if orbits aren't perfectly circular. It's a weird, it's a weird thing to wrap your head around, but that's really the, that social movement is what leads, leads to that. Um, and then remember the last one is the stellar parallax. Now he's still, his telescope wasn't good enough to observe stellar parallax as this, the earth went around the sun. So remember earth on one side, see a star against the background on the other side, it's going to appear to be in a different position. What he was able to do though, is notice that Oh yeah, we're coming to that next. Um, what he was able to notice was that the Milky Way was made up of, t actually made up of stars. It wasn't just this cloud. And by observing that these stars were, um, that the Milky Way was actually distinct tiny dots did start to make people realize that maybe there are astronomical dist that these distances are astronomical, that, that they are incredibly far away. Um, <laughs> that's awesome, Maharishi. That's uh, hey, wherever you learn your knowledge, that, that works. Now, um, so those were Galileo's contributions to directly refute any of the issues people were having with the heliocentric model. Um, those were the things that he did that directly led to that. 
what he did next, which Todd mentions, really, I mean, nail in the coffin. Um, they weren't the social issues that people were having getting over the imperfections and, you know, these ideas of Aristotle. But he made observations that was like, nope, that's no question now at this point. First one was the Jovian moons. So uh, these two are kind of parallel. I'm going to talk about two examples. Um, Todd talked about the, the Venus phases, which we'll, I'll show next. But the first one is the Jovian moons. That this is, These are his notes. So he was observing Jupiter, and he saw little dots around Jupiter that as he progressed through different days throughout a year, they moved, and they went around Jupiter which was weird to think that there were other objects orbiting other planets. Um, that starts to break down this helio or this geocentric idea super fast, observing other objects orbiting um, other, other planets. The next thing he did was observe the phases of Venus. And this is it. This is a, this is a no brainer that we're done. It's just nail in the coffin for the, the Ptolemaic geocentric model. Um, <laughs> no kidding, Becca. I, I agree. It's, it's pretty phenomenal when you look through a telescope and you're able to actually see the Jovian moons. Um, now, the Ptolemaic model, this is the one, remember, from the Greeks that puts the Earth at the center that has a very complicated motions around. If you observe phases of Venus as he was doing here, if Earth was at the center and in the Ptolemaic model, Venus moves around like this, you would only see crescent moons, crescent images of Venus. If the sun is at the center and Venus is going around the sun, then you would see it full and then partially full and then crescent and then back full again which is exactly what Galileo observed with his telescope. So if he hadn't seen these phases evolving, because prior, you can, write, you can wonder, well, why didn't they see that before? The, tel the telescope wasn't being used. There was no telescope. So with the naked eye, like I said, knowing that there are phases to Venus, you can kind of convince yourself of it, but you can see it very clearly with a telescope. Um, prior to that, Remember, we don't really understand distances. We're not really understanding what the relationship is, where things are. It could be that maybe these crescents are just incredibly bright and our eyes just couldn't, you know, resolve that. This was clear, irrefutable. Um, there are phases to Venus that is only possible if it is going around the sun. And then therefore we have to be going around the sun as well. The other thing that he observed was a transit of Mercury. He saw Mercury pass in front of the sun and move through it. Um, so that, again, had to, it, that means that it's going around the sun. So he was able to observe that, and that was pretty much nail in the coffin. Um, so the last thing is a lot of people understand that, you know, Copernicus had this idea. He resurrected the idea that the sun is at the center of the solar system. He took all the Ptolemaic data, it didn't quite work. It was still hard to deal with. Tycho Brahe tried to make it better. Johannes Kepler was the one that um, let go of the idea that they were circular orbits, which let that, um, which made everything else fall into place. This trans, and then Galileo comes along, refutes all of these other hangups to the heliocentric model, and then makes observations with the Jovian moons, the phases of Venus, and a transit of Mercury that really, it's irrefutable at this point. The other big thing about this transit of Mercury is that what he observed perfectly matched Kepler's um, laws. Because of the Kepler's laws made us able to then apply Tycho Brahe's data to it, predict motions, and Mercury appeared exactly where it was supposed to be. Um, with the sun at the center, eccentric orbits, all of the things wrapped in a nice pretty bow. Um, yeah, Andrew, no, Stellarium is, is awesome for, for playing with that and being able to see it. And it's, it's fabulous. Now, so that's where Galileo came and kind of said, okay, <laughs> Copernicus was right. Kepler's right. We've, we've observed everything. Again, it's, it's really interesting the relationship we have where we have Copernicus kind of has that theory 
Um, Tico Brahe takes a lot of data. Kepler has, you know, the theories that then apply to that data, and then Galileo makes those observations. So I've talked a lot about how astronomy is this back and forth between theory and observation. We have it very clearly here with the Copernican revolution. Copernicus theory, Tycho Brahe data, Kepler theory, Galileo. They're all using each other's stuff. They're all still living in both realms, but that's how we make these big strides in astronomy. Now, a lot of us know, or at least have heard of maybe the uh, relationship with Galileo and the church. Um, in 1633, he was brought in front of the church for an inquisition. There's lots of great, beautiful, awesome art that has to do with this. And the legend is, is that um, as he was, you know, they made Galileo publicly refute the heliocentric model that, you know, he's just proven. Uh, they made him detract and basically say, sure, church, fine, whatever. <laughs> and then uh, the legend is, is that as he got up to leave, he said, et pur se mueve, which means, and yet it moves, um, referring to the earth. And yet it moves. Now, the... The ref refutation of that is, yes, yes, excellent episode of the West Wing. Um, the refutation of that is basically that if Galileo had said that loud enough for anyone to hear it, they would have killed him. Um, ooh, my camera just froze. Sorry, let me change that real quick. I can still hear you. That did not freeze in a, <laughs> in a great spot there. There we go. All right, so you can still see me. Um, sort of. There we go. Um, yeah, it's, uh, they basically said that if he had actually said that and they had actually heard him say it, they, pff, that he wouldn't have made it out of that room. Um, but there's lots of interesting things you can dig up and learn about, uh, Galileo and other people who had refuted the church and, um, <laughs> and why Galileo was specifically kind of targeted for that. The interesting thing with this, because the church led a lot of other people, I mean, this was a scientific revolution. People were accepting it and we were good with it. But really what happened is apparently Galileo is a bit of a pain. <laughs> and he had published a story um, that was a debate between someone who believed the sun was at the center, someone who believed the earth was at the center. And he basically said, um, he called the character who believed the earth was at the center simpleton. And the Pope believed that he was very much being targeted there, that he was the dumb simpleton and had none of it. <laughs> so, uh, so Galileo is just a, a pain in the butt, which I respect and I appreciate because someone's got to be. But <laughs> anyway, uh, that's sort of the, the legend why, you know, Galileo was particularly targeted by the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church did not let go for a long time with this stuff. Um, it wasn't until the 17, late 1700s that they took heliocentric texts off of their banned list, where members of the Catholic Church were allowed to read them. Um, and then it wasn't until the 1900s like 1990s or I think it was 1990 that the church uh, refuted their um, their uh, admonition of Galileo that they basically said all right we'll let it go <laughs> but yeah you know we're sorry um, wasn't until the 1990s so yep on that note uh, <laughs> I love that we'll just uh, <laughs> um, Oh, you guys are fabulous. Janeway is to time travel, Galileo is to Catholicism. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, the Catholic Church probably viewed Galileo the same way that the temporal cops viewed Janeway. <laughs> and I love that. We'll go with that. Um, so on that note, that kind of um, concludes this lecture. Uh, I will stop the recording here. If you are watching this on YouTube, please don't forget to subscribe. And if you have questions, you can leave them in the comments and feel free to join our conversations on Friday at 1 p.m. Pacific time. Mm -hmm.